solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. My final duty station in late 2017, early 2018 to the USS Carl Vinson, where I managed the flight deck there. And some of the biggest achievements of my life occurred there. Not only did I make chief, but I, I had 70 amazing uh, men and women, uh, sailors, that were under my leadership, under my guideship uh, directly. We managed the flight deck. That was our soul, was the hangar bay and the flight deck. Um, and then I, I actually, this is a funny story. Yeah. So somehow this chick who didn't do high school sports or anything, <laughs> let me make that very clear. My sports yeah. history before the Navy is non-existent. Okay. Okay. And somehow, some way I found it in me that I have this skill and this passion for fitness, which translates to life, but I applied to be the command fitness leader, which is an officer's billet for the carrier, right? So oh, this wow. is, we're talking about 3000 people. Yeah. I'm like one being referred to the commanding officer and the executive mm -hmm. officer saying she's got what it takes mm -hmm. and also competing against other officers, basically telling them like, Hey guys, I got it. D don't worry yeah. about it. I got this. <laughs> so, uh, I scored the billet. So in addition to managing my 70 sailors, I had the honor of directly managing an additional 25 sailors and overseeing the fitness program for 3000 people. What? Sorry to interrupt. I'm just really curious. What does a fitness program look like at sea mm. on an aircraft carrier? So I worked in conjunction with MWR. Morale, welfare, and recreation. And we had a fit boss. So we had a civilian, I can't remember his name. He was phenomenal. But we had some other sailors that were also, they were, some were skilled, some had their own personal certifications or skills, talents in leading fitness programs or fitness like group exercise, like a yoga or a cycling or just a, like a body exercise. And so at sea, because we're all responsible for ourselves at the end, right? We are our own responsibility to ensure that we pass the fitness test because we have to hold ourselves accountable. So there are gyms on board the ship. The hangar bays have plenty of room that you could do your own workout routine. There's gear that you could borrow. You have places that you could bring stuff. Like I like to do yoga. There's treadmills to run. There was other cardio machines, other weight machines, body weight exercises. So I was overall overseeing the progress or assisting folks and then guiding my sailors who were also teaching their independent departments and their independent divisions within the departments to help guide the sailors that needed just a little bit more effort. Because sometimes it's not just a physical thing, it's a mental thing, a mental block. So to get them to be encouraged, answer questions to the best of my ability, because I'm not a dietitian. I took a course, the Navy had me take a group fitness certification course, but I'm not a PT. I'm not a dietitian. I can only go off of some basic stuff. Eat simply. You're simple. Okay. Don't lessen how much you eat to a point where you're in a deficit all the time because then things happen and it actually counters it, but also don't overindulge and try to find that balance. But yeah, like just encouraging them, helping them with a workout routine and, and just, yeah, and I, I loved it. I loved it. Okay. I like that. I was, I don't know why, but I was envisioning like 3000 people doing like burpees on the, like no. on the like aircraft carrier deck or something. And you're like, got a megaphone, like up, down, no. up, no. down. <laughs> I would that not be that encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. PT test, like our fitness tests would take three weeks to get everybody through them. Three to four weeks to get. Where do you run? Through. Is it like um, on a treadmill, or do you literally C, do we laps? Do treadmills. We were also authorized um, bikes, um, and then the elliptical used to be, but I think the row machine was coming out or did come out right around the time I retired. So for the cardio option, those are an option when we're ashore. Swimming is optional. And then we have a track. I yeah. prefer to get people on the track. It's more mm -hmm. accurate than a treadmill. 
For sure. um, but they can use a treadmill. And then of course, push-ups and sit-ups. The planks started coming, phasing in as I retired. So that makes sense. You would be, yeah. you would have to be an insane person to choose to do the rowing machine for your physical, for your cardio like option. Cause that suck. Like the rower sucks. Like that is, <laughs> it is not fun. I don't know. Like props to whoever decides to do that. All I knew is I'm going to have a pension and this career field getting into EMT was my next best thing. And I lucked out, but it, it didn't come without costs. Like I, I was afraid, honestly afraid. And that goes in line with the fact that I went, I went, I grew up here, went through high school, graduated high school, right into the Navy and without disrespecting it, but I was institutionalized by the service. It's so, not a disrespect. Yeah. It's just what it is. It's you become indoctrinated into the force because we need people to fall in line for it to be an effective fighting force. Like it's just what it is. And that's not a knock on the military. It's just like a fact of life. So I totally get that. Yeah. So it was definitely like on the way out the door was definitely a huge challenge and huge fear. When I was like, well, where am I going to live? Where do I want to go? Some folks, they want to stay there. They want to get jobs and they want to stay in the federal side of it, the DOD side of it. And I knew I, I just, I didn't want any part of it. I got offered jobs through Raytheon, other friends that I have, well, family, I consider them family, 40s that are in the field and they're doing great. They're well off. They wanted me to come in there and I would, it's just not my thing. And so I turned it down with respect because it, it's just, I would rather somebody who has a passion for the job and to be able to continue that. How do you think you got through those moments of fear and uncertainty? Oh, I definitely didn't do it alone. Um, and, and I encourage anybody who's listening to this, you, you're not alone. Please reach out. The first few months after my, like almost the first six months ish after my retirement, I stayed busy. I traveled a lot. I took up a side job. I worked in Alaska and then I went to school and I got my wilderness EMT certification through Knowles. But after that graduation in December of 21, I hit the lowest of my lows. I started dating somebody and I think I was just in a place where I was trying to fill a hole. I've been in a position in, in, in the Navy where I was needed. And now I don't hear from anybody. I, my cell phone is no longer a ball and chain. I'm not responsible for sailors getting in trouble or whatever. And I had nothing to do and it was toxic. I was not in a good place. And so I was here at home for a little bit and then I made a decision. I was volunteering at the ambulance station I now work at, but I made a decision to move back here. Well, shortly after I moved back here to PA, um, I ended up in the hospital because I hit such a low depression. The real suicide thoughts were there. And it's really hard to admit that because I just spent the last 20 years sacrificing my life for so many and i am here in pennsylvania and there's not a lot of military here there's not a lot of folks to really relate with and i'm fresh out of the service and i don't know how to communicate with people i can't relate with anybody when i was told by someone that oh you're out of the service now you just have to forget that it all ever happened and that'll, that's just what you have to do. It's no longer a part of your life. And that really hurt because for more than I was alive, I, I was in the Navy. That's all I know. And they're my comrades. They're the people that I trusted with my life. And I'm out here and I feel vulnerable. I feel exposed. Um, and I don't feel safe anywhere. Even to this day, I'm more settled in now. But to this day, I, I don't go, I don't do well in enclosed public spaces. Um, I'm on guard. Um, and I have these conversations with some other brethren that I've met along the way here. 
but I definitely could not have gotten to where I'm at in this point, And I still have work to do, but without the help of other folks, as I was transitioning out, I'd call some of my friends who are still in and I didn't know what I was reaching for. I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know what I was missing. I didn't know what I wanted. I was lost. I didn't know who I was. I'm still discovering that. And then there was a vet center down, down near Philly. And I reached out to him and he sat me down for a little bit and he helped me get past this shoulda, coulda, woulda point that no matter what I decided to do, nothing's going to change that I am here now and to practice presence. And, and it was not too long after I was in the hospital for just, I took myself there because I knew that if I would have stayed by myself any longer, it was not going to end well. Why didn't you follow through when you hit the bottom? What stopped you? What catches you and or caught you in that moment? I think about my nieces and nephews mm -hmm. and I think about the, the lives I've touched and I'm reminded of those lives. I've got little trinkets that sit around in my home mm -hmm. that are just, they're small little things that people have given me. And I, I am very humbly reminded that it's okay to hit a bottom. Yeah. It is not okay to stay in the bottom. Hmm. Um, I love that. Yeah. Like life is peaks and valleys mm -hmm. and we're going to summit a peak frequently in our lives. Mm -hmm. But in order to summit that peak, I have to start from somewhere. So mm -hmm. I was, I reached a bottom. I reached the start line and I had to face things that I hadn't faced before. And I think the realization came to me that um, this was a breakthrough for me. Yeah. And that ending it is not going to solve the problem. Mm. But facing it is going to strengthen me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to reach a new summit. So honestly, what started to help me drive out of that hole, I ran, I used to run. So I started running besides what the Navy mandated me to do, which oh, by the way, I hated because they're like, oh yeah, you're going to run a mile and a half. And I'm like, oh, literally oh, like, just like anybody else. Um, so in 2008, I started, I ran my first 5k. Remember I went into the Navy in 2001. So something sparked a, a fire up my ass. And I ran my first half marathon in 2010 and my first marathon in 2014. I swore I would never run another marathon again. Um, and here you I are. Did not hold. <laughs> it was so miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fair. Most, most marathons, first timers are pretty rough, right? It was a beautiful course. Highly beautiful course. And I encourage anybody, if you're going to challenge, excuse me, challenge yourself, run a marathon. It'll change your life. So I ran my first ultra in 2019. That was a 50 mile course. And, but after I retired or, well, because the whole world was in shambles between 2020 and 2022, uh, my running took a, a deplete. So I knew that one, if I got back to running, I knew that I would start to feel better, right? There's a lot of endorphins that come out of it, toxins that are released through sweat, you name it, and just whatever. Two, the, what was I going to say? So if I got back to running, that would help. But two, it's, I need goals. Like I have to, I am a goal getter. It doesn't mean I'm setting, like I had to find somebody and my coach, Aaron, shout out Aaron Stacy with Primal Run Coaching. He has been a godsend with me and he helped me through some really tough emotional spots, mainly as a coach, because what he does, he writes my plans 
And then I'll hit lows. Like right now I'm in a doubt phase because I have an event coming up in a couple weeks and I'm starting to feel everything creep in. And there were times like I'd call him up just bawling, like, ah! like, <laughs> but we started from scratch. So that building phase relates back to that peaks and valleys that I'm not going to summit that peak unless I hit some spots in between. So, or some folks who might've gone through some 12 step programs, I call them baby steps. So I'm not gonna just jump right in to another 50 mile course. Cause I know it's gonna one deplete my confidence level or what's left of it at this point. So we started small, we started building from base and it built me this inner strength like every little run is a new achievement. Plus it's trail running. So I'm finding a lot of post veteran programs that are starting taking veterans outside and I'm encouraging anybody. You don't have to do ultras. You don't have to run fast. Trust me, I don't run fast. There's hiking involved and grumbling and crying and all sorts of other weird things. But running trails saved my life. There is a active presence that you need to maintain. <laughs> Otherwise you will eat rock. Yes. Like, and rocks don't taste good. Okay. Nor do they not feel good, but the blood, if you're not gorophobic, like <laughs> the blood is kind of fun, but, um, running trails really taught me how to maintain presence. It brought discipline back into my life. It brought routine. It brought regiment. But it also opened my soul. If you see some trail runners, a lot of times they're quirky. Because if you're left alone for hours on the trails, God knows what conversations you have with the trees. Um, and, uh, you know, and like the bar is low, right? There's no expectations out there. But you know, the biggest thing that I truly love about the trail family is the family. These, I just worked at the Tahoe 200 and the Bigfoot 200 for Destination Trail. And I've, I missed this so much. And it was the camaraderie, the cohesion, the team, the family, even though this is a very individual sport. As a trail runner, you rely on some of these folks to help you through some tough moments. You rely on the aid stations to help get food in your system or the medics to force feed you even though you're vomiting. And it goes back to what I've missed when I was in the Navy. Somebody holding me accountable, somebody being there to say, you can do it or quit being a pussy. Like fuck whatever's running through your brain right now. Don't give it life. And to, and the discipline to stay on course, that moment, that, that moment when you just want to fucking quit and you're frustrated, everything hurts and you're pushing our umpty squat and you've still got miles to go. And you're just like, what the fuck am I doing here? And, and you're wondering how many times you peed. Those are real things, but these are real things we've faced in our branches of service, right? In our jobs. When was the last time I peed? How much water did I drink? Did I eat today? Why is Taylor so-and-so doing this right now? So all those things, and that honest to God, getting deeper and deeper into ultra running, not only has really projected me in a very forward and, and amazing motion, saved my life. It truly saved my life. These folks... Just, I'm passionate for these runners, not just as a EMT, because I do love all my patients and I wish them all the very best. But when you meet these runners and I've been truly honored to work on some of these runners, these athletes, oh my God, like I, I geeked out meeting some of them, but it has nothing to do with like their status quo it has everything to do with them achieving a goal. And I selfishly am able to fulfill that hole of being needed. And I, I really feel like, because I not only run the trails, but I volunteer and work at trail races. 
I give back to these family because they too, they are, they need that assistance and they can't achieve that goal without somebody being there to assist them to achieve it. So it, it's, it's a beautiful culture. When Northrop or whoever backs up the money truck and your friends are like, we'll get you a job for $300,000 or whatever it's going to be. How do you, in that moment, overcome the greed or just like that? Like, have you just never been a money motivated person or what was the, what kind of was, what did that look like for you in your brain space? I honestly, I'm not a money motivated person. Um, and there's a backstory to it, which I won't get into, but it's just, I want to live. I want to live. That doesn't mean that I don't want the money because it would, <laughs> that money would be able to get me to do the things that I really love doing, like buying new running shoes and running dumb races like Barclays or UTMB. And it might be able to pay my coach every month. Um, <laughs> you know? but it's not about the money. It's really not. It's about fulfilling the passion because at the end of the day, all I got is today. And I want to go out of this world knowing that I gave myself every opportunity to fulfill my dreams. And to all that that are money driven and you want the money, go for it. For, for those that are sitting on the fence wondering, well, well what am I going to do? Well, what do you like? What do you love? What do you feel good at? What do you feel best at? What's your passion? And because at the end of the day, yeah, I live in a fifth wheel camper, but I have experiences to talk about because like my couch really doesn't matter how much I spent on the couch. It's still going to be sat on and destroyed. The comfort of my mattress will fade away. I'm going to end up getting a new one. So I don't need things. I live for experiences. So the money I'm not spending on a big fancy house or property taxes, because <laughs> living in a camper, there's none of those, but the money I'm not spending on things is going to experiences. So I'm not, you can throw $300,000 at me and offer me a job, but if you're going to take the time away from me and ask me to work a nine to five, that's, that's my drive is the freedom to be able to go on adventures and to truly live. Because for the last 20 years, I have been under the government's thumb, being told where I'm supposed to be, when I'm supposed to be there. And oh, by the way, if I want to go out of a 360 mile radius, I've got to ask God and country and God help you if you want to travel overseas. Yeah. So, so somewhere, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Somewhere your security clearance won't let you go. So yeah. Exactly. So I just, it's, it would be great. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just not my thing. Hey, everybody. I really hope that you liked this super cut of the post military podcast. If you did and you want to see more, I would recommend that you check out the whole episode, which is here on YouTube and also on multiple different podcasting platforms. If you like this and you want to support the channel, I would ask that you give the video a like, subscribe, and uh, share the content with those who might need to hear it. Thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you in the next episode. Peace.